What do you remember from the last great console war? Can you recall the mindless violence? Entire battlefields littered with the dead after countless months of endless conflict? Or the political fallout where hordes of governmental officials deliberated for weeks over where everything went so wrong? How about the overwhelming reality that console wars are a pointless fabrication that means nothing and has no real purpose other than to divide the masses into fan bases with very little crossover? Yeah, that's what I remember, and with video games having such a rich, illustrious history, there's been conflict among fans of certain consoles for actual decades, and that's a long time for something to not matter. Despite that, I want to talk about it, so if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to look back on nearly 50 years of history and work out who won each console generation? Everyone good with that? Alright, let's go. Annoyingly, the first generation of consoles is one of the hardest to pin down and pick a winner from. The early stages of video game history are characterised by experimentation and a ton of different people and companies trying their hand at seeing what this new form of digital entertainment can offer. The very first commercially available video game console was the Magnavox Odyssey that came with 13 games, with one of them being table tennis, which was famously tweaked in just enough places for Atari to morph it into Pong, a game so popular that there were entire consoles made just to play it. This is part of what makes this generation so hard to characterise, since so many consoles had their games hardwired into the machine itself, since the industry hadn't quite grasped the concept of removable games that you could swap in and out. The biggest success story is undoubtedly Pong the video game, since every manufacturer wanted to get a slice of that action and the arcade version helped to launch that particular industry, but there wasn't one quintessential console that you had to own to play the definitive version of Pong. I'm inclined to veer more in the direction of the Magnavox Odyssey since it had everything in the right place and would be the model by which future consoles were designed, but it didn't really make a lot of money for Magnavox. I suppose it all depends on what kind of criteria we're using for this video, whether it's financial success, or how good the console is, or even how iconic the console is within the vast history of video games. Ultimately, winning a console generation is all about financial clout, so maybe it should fall to Nintendo's Color TV game that sold 3 million copies in Japan and brought them into the video game market, so maybe that? If we're talking consoles that were actually released in the West, then maybe Atari's home Pong for what it meant for the future of home consoles, but I'm gonna be honest here, I don't really know. We're starting off shaky, but trust me, it gets better from here. Let's say the home Pong and move on. Thankfully, things are way easier with the second generation of consoles, since the success of Pong allowed Atari to basically do what they wanted for at least five years. They looked at the Odyssey and thought, hey, that whole removable cartridge thing looks cool, why don't we do that, but better? And so blasted the world with some Atari 2600 action to help launch the gaming industry in the right direction. They ended up having so many games made for this thing and had so much success from it that the rest of the competition spent most of this generation playing catch up. And even though the Vectrex and Intellivision put up a good fight, there was no touching the 2600 once it was up to speed. Unfortunately, this generation is also remembered for one thing in particular, and that would be the incredible oversaturation in the console market that ultimately caused the video game crash of 1983, and even though Atari were having a pretty good time of it in the early 80s, even they weren't immune to the problems that arose once the general public started to lose interest in game consoles in favour of personal computers. The video game industry was still a bit of a niche market in the 1980s, and so when the public began to lose confidence in its products, it didn't take much to give a lot of the companies in it financial difficulties. Atari contributed more than most, but lost more than the average manufacturer too, so while the 2600 won the battle, Atari would end up losing the war, and now they're making hotels in Arizona, so who's the real winner here? Can't help but feel like a fool from grace. From the ashes of a smouldering industry rose a phoenix tasked with reviving the video game industry and pointing it in the right direction. Nintendo weren't new to making consoles, since the Color TV game was inspired by Magnavox's and Atari's successes with home consoles, and the Game & Watch was the world's first handheld console, but the Big Daddy would come in 1983, roughly at the same time as the market was crashing hard in the US. 
Japan was still on board with game consoles for the most part, and so Nintendo stole a march on the competition with their Famicom, that was so popular and amazing that it somehow was able to swim the Pacific Ocean on its own to dazzle the American market in 1985 under the new name of the Nintendo Entertainment System, specifically named to distance itself from the stigma surrounding video game consoles at the time. Unsurprisingly, it was kind of amazing, with the NES boasting groundbreaking games like Super Mario Bros, The Legend of Zelda, and Metroid that helped to set itself apart from some of the more simplistic games that had preceded it, and by the time Nintendo stopped selling it, the NES shipped over 60 million units worldwide and brought Nintendo right into the picture for supremacy in the video game industry. Not to say that there weren't other consoles around during this time, since Sega found some success with the Master System in Europe, but lost out to the NES everywhere else, and somehow Atari was still kicking with the 7800, although not with any kind of major financial gain for the company. It did have backwards compatibility with the 2600, so you can sense a bit of Atari trying to recapture the glory of their golden years, but the die was cast and Nintendo were here to stay. How the hell do you beat them? I wasn't exactly alive for any of this so far, and that trend continues into the fourth generation, so I don't truly know how hotly contested any of these previous conflicts were. The fourth generation was different though, because there were two main competitors, and if you know anything about this period, you don't get any prizes for guessing who they were. Nintendo were going from strength to strength in the console market, being able to use some of that sweet NES money to fund its sequel, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, as well as their groundbreaking handheld, the Game Boy. Both of these consoles were huge, albeit for different reasons, as the SNES was a mere continuation of the NES, with the games playing more of a starring role, whereas the Game Boy was just the coolest shit ever and let you play Tetris while in the queue for a Nirvana concert, I presume. Massive moments in gaming history for sure, but surprise surprise, it was Sega that provided the most pushback to Nintendo's Monopoly. Fuck the Master System, we've got the Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, or as it was known when distributed by Samsung in South Korea, the Super Aladdin Boy. Oh, a whole new world indeed. The major difference this time around was Sega had claws and a shiny new mascot called Sonic the Hedgehog. With a cutthroat approach to marketing, Sega dragged back so much share of the market from Nintendo at a time when it seemed like they were perfectly poised to dominate for years to come. This is when the first true console war was waged between Nintendo's SNES and Sega's Genesis, and there were absolutely no punches pulled whatsoever. Sega ran so many ads claiming that their stuff did what Nintendo don't. Nintendo lied about sales figures to boost their public image, and generally there was so much back and forth that this ran and ran for virtually the entire generation. Ultimately, Sega wrestled back 65% of the market from Nintendo despite selling less Genesis's than Nintendo sold SNES's, and considering the position Nintendo were in at the start of the generation, it's a massive win for Sega. Not that Nintendo didn't have any wins, since the Game Boy ran rampant in its own handheld market with the Sega Game Gear not really providing much competition, so they won that, but not the big prize. And they only hand out big prizes here. Nintendo deserve a big mark against them for their role in the creation of their biggest competitors during the fifth generation, the Sony PlayStation. Ah, but what about Sega, I hear you ask, but sadly their next major follow-up to the Genesis that falls inside a separate generation is the Sega Saturn, which was so different the developers didn't know how to make games for it, and so it released with only a few games available and earlier than anticipated, so retailers didn't have much stock or just flat out refused to sell it out of anger. So that rules out Sega, and we should probably also rule out Atari since they made the Jaguar, which just didn't really do anything. There was also the 3DO, which had some fancy tech behind it, but cost an absolute arse load of money to buy, and not enough people did, so it's just Nintendo and Sony this time. And really, the only reason why it isn't just Nintendo, with a free shot of basically the entire market, is because they went back on a deal with Sony to create a console that used CD-ROMs, a decision they justified with concern over Sony using the deal to try to squeeze their way into the console market. So Nintendo pulled the plug and the two companies parted ways to make their own consoles, but Sony used the CD technology to push their PlayStation into a very advantageous position that no amount of Nintendo 64 or incredible video games could dislodge. 
The N64 had a lot going for it, don't get me wrong, including some masterfully crafted 3D games, but everyone was making 3D games at that point, and the PS1 did massive numbers throughout its run, and with sales figures in excess of 100 million units, it's still the third best selling console of all time 27 years later. I love a lot of the games that ended up on the N64, but I can't not give this one to the PS1, because honestly, debuts don't come much better than this. It's more of the same in Gen 6, since Sony had pocketed just a fuckload of money from the PS1, and Nintendo still had a fair deal of success with the N64 and were poised to do battle once more. Except, what's this? A challenger approaches! And his name is Bill Microsoft. He has a lot of money, but wants more, and saw how much money Sony made from the PS1, and so wants in on this very lucrative video game industry thingy. And so it came to be that console wars would be fought between three parties from here on out, although it is worth mentioning that Sega still had a Dreamcast to show the world, but the world wasn't really all that interested. The original Xbox is a hefty beast that would probably kill a man if it fell on him, but it had some good stuff on it like Halo and Fable, and was a viable option to the two main competitors, with Microsoft able to claw a fair chunk of the market for itself, and even sell more units than Nintendo did with the GameCube. Ah, the GameCube, a funny time in Nintendo's history where they seemed torn on what to put out into the world and slap together a purple cube that finally uses disc technology but just wasn't as appealing as the Xbox or the incredibly attractive PS2. As far as sequels go in modern media, this might just be the best of the lot because there was a lot riding on this console after the success of the PS1 and Sony had to get it right. What metric do you want me to read out in terms of justifying that Sony definitely got it right? It is the best selling console of all time, home to some of the best games ever made on any console, and even if you didn't fancy any of those, you could always play PS1 games on it because it was fully backwards compatible. This wasn't a console war between Sony, Nintendo and Microsoft, this was a fucking demolition job where Sony swept up and left all other competitors frantically looking around for a way of toppling this behemoth. Or just hope they topple themselves. Sony's chances of a third winning generation in a row were dealt a pretty devastating blow straight out of the gate when they unveiled the PlayStation 3 to, let's say, a lukewarm reception. They promised a lot and claimed that the console could play some unbelievably good looking games but fell down as soon as it came to the price with it sending you back up to 599 US dollars and it was very hard to claw things back from there. The PS3 had its exclusives though and was able to ship for a lower price eventually, but by the time it was into its stride, public perception had shifted in favour of Microsoft and Nintendo. The Xbox 360 wasn't without its problems though, since early versions of the console were susceptible to hardware failure and overheating which caused the infamous Red Ring of Death that became such a feature of this console in the early days. With Microsoft and Sony faltering, what did Nintendo do? Whatever the fuck they wanted. I'd love to know what the thinking was behind the Nintendo Wii, because while it's clearly intended as an exploration of motion controls and new technology that may impact video games in a positive way, it feels like Nintendo deliberately intended for this console to appeal to a more casual audience who aren't so interested in processing power and teraflops. You stack the Wii up against either the Xbox 360 or the PS3 and it's nowhere near as powerful, but the appeal came from the type of games that were released on the system. Ones that anyone can pick up and play due to the accessibility of the hardware. And with Sony and Microsoft floundering for a foothold, Nintendo took full advantage and raked in the sales figures. Now that the DS was fully up to speed, Nintendo were able to climb back to the top of the pile and enjoyed the kind of success that they hadn't had for a couple of decades really. Evidently there was life in the old dog yet. Who here remembers the Ouya? You know, the... the, the Ouya? Alright, okay, anyway, so the 8th generation was long. I mean, most generations last maybe 5 or 6 years, with the exception of Gen 8, which started in 2011, when Nintendo succeeded the DS with the fancy 3DS, and ended just last year, when Sony and Microsoft brought out new consoles within 2 days of each other. So that's 9 years worth of history to pick through, and things immediately get confusing when you think that Nintendo brought out 2 consoles in that time. The Wii U attempted to reheat the excitement surrounding the Wii, but fell so far short that it didn't even outsell the GameCube, with the console itself suffering from poor marketing, and a name that makes it seem like an add-on for the Wii instead of an original console. 
They were still making some stellar games for the system, but it didn't matter much when the console couldn't get far off the ground. Somehow, against all odds, Nintendo turned all of this failure into one of the most exciting consoles around, since the Switch came out in 2017 and technically belongs to the 8th generation of consoles, so I have to include it in the same discussion as the PS4 and Xbox One. The Switch was long speculated to be everything from a VR console to having a huge reflective controller, but reality was a lot more rewarding, since this console handheld hybrid allowed Nintendo to save a lot of face in a post Wii U era, and it's now the place to play gigantic games like like Skyrim, Doom, L.A. Noir, on the go, in, in public. It's not a bad turnaround. Sony and Microsoft were predictably at each other's throats again, but this time, Sony weren't messing around with their new PS4. Microsoft kinda did with the Xbox One since they still wanted to persist with the Kinect, which was a fun-ish gimmick with the 360, but had overstayed its welcome with the latest iteration, and now was required to be always on, always watching, always listening. Plus, Microsoft had to stick up their butts about used games since you'd need to be connected to the internet to play them, which would then check that they're not associated with your account and it was all a bit of a mess. Microsoft would later backtrack on these features after weeks of criticism, but the damage was done and the door was wide open for Sony to capitalise with the PS4 simply being fairly normal by comparison. Nothing too crazy about this thing, it plays some very nice looking video games, but crucially, managed to steer clear of a lot of the issues plaguing the Xbox One, and that counts for a lot. Judging a winner is hard, because the PS4 was the clear victor against the Xbox One, but if you count the Switch in the mix, then I'd say that might have the edge. I guess it just depends on how you classify a console generation and where the line is. Damn it, Nintendo! Releasing a console halfway through a console generation just to make this video a bit harder to judge. It's not helpful one bit. I thought I might as well talk about the ninth generation without passing any true judgement since it's been a couple of months and you can't learn a thing about the PS5 and the Xbox Series X in that time. Especially if you're like me and you haven't been able to buy either console since both were undersupplied for ridiculous demand and any restocks are typically met with website crashes and everything being sold out inside a few minutes. So it's hard for me to judge for that big reason, but also because two months in, nothing's really happened for either console. They've both had their fair share of quality titles and a handful of killer exclusives, so at this stage it comes down to brand loyalty or which one you like the look of most. I still think the PS5 looks hideous, and since it's taller than the PS4, I need to find a new place to put it in my setup, but the Xbox Series X is deceptively large too, but frankly it's an Xbox console, we're just lucky that it can't be used as a deadly weapon. Plus we've got the Stadia in there too, pretending to be relevant to the conversation, but maybe they could have some kind of resurgence in the next couple of years. Perhaps the Switch belongs to this generation instead, and has its sights set on maintaining its momentum, with newer consoles for competition. I don't know, but I do know that it's too early to pick a winner for a generation that is only a couple of months old. Maybe we'll pick things up in a few years and see where we stand. Or maybe we'll have another market crash and nothing will matter at all? It's good to keep all possibilities open because you never know what kind of crazy bullshit will happen next. Maybe people will start buying the Stadia. That'd be wild. <laughs>